So Abhishek, if you have anything to say, then just say it in the chat, okay? And I'll, I'll repeat anything you say in the chat. All right, so uh, this is what he sent to me. And he says, I know that the Einstein equation, xi equals x minus vt divided by the square root of 1 minus v2 divided by c2 is wrong because of the following two reasons. One, it has been derived by using normalization. And, and two, it mistreats the average intercept length of a ray of light traveling along the x-axis as the x-coordinate of the position of a point with respect to the inner system. I also know that the equation has been assumed to be correct for almost a century and has been considered the equation for length contraction. But now I find that even that if that even if that equation is assumed correct, it would imply length expansion instead of length contraction. My explanation for this is given below. The original length of the inner system is x minus vt. The value of square root 1 minus v2 divided c2 is less than 1. So dividing x minus vt by square root 1 minus v2 divided c2 will produce a value greater than x minus vt instead of a value less than x minus vt. Then why that equation been considered the equation for length contraction instead of length expansion? All right, so that's what he says. Uh, I'm going to open it up for initial comments. Does anyone have any comments about this? I personally didn't know that this was derived using normalization, and I'm not quite sure what is meant by number two as far as this average intercept length goes. I'd, I'd question why it means anything. Isn't this like so far out on the theoretical branch of physics? Like, um, is there any real significance to length expansion or contraction beyond the fact that we can't do any physical experiments that would ever reveal it anyway? So, you know, isn't it kind of meaningless? Well, I think this is a pretty big thing in relativity. I think there's quite a bit of controversy as to whether length contraction actually occurs or whether it's just like a visual effect where it appears to be smaller but doesn't actually get physically smaller. Right, well, I just mean so, though, that the only, the only time it kicks in is when you're doing thought experiments. I mean, you can't do it with like real trains or you can't do it with real tunnels and you can't do it with anything real. So I just sort of mean that it's, you know, it's, it's almost like the argument about time dilation and human perception. We don't even have evidence you can move humans at, you know, uh, close to light speed or something without them completely disintegrating. I and mean, we have no evidence that there's any proportionality to how time changes when you speed up a human being. So the whole thing is just made out of what happens in a world that we'll never experience. Uh, I think the approach of Well, let's take a look at. Uh... Go ahead, Bill. Um, the uh, in um, uh, accelerator experiments, we test <clears throat> some of the results of relativity uh, regularly, and it's real data. And uh, so, for instance, if you take a, a muon, which is an elementary particle that we make in copious quantities in uh, accelerators, and uh, you uh, accelerate it, you find that the decay half-life increases because of the increased binding of the particle. And so you could call it link contraction, the increased binding or whatever, but the, these type effects exist. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm always denying the fact that there's a connection between the degrade in how a clock functions and how fast you're moving the clock. The argument is, is whether length contraction or expansion you can't visualize it, you can't see it with a muon or any other particle. You won't see them stretched in any way. There's no way to measure their stretch. So 
in my opinion, it's just kind of a moot point, whether it does or does not contract, in my opinion, doesn't mean too much. And I also would dispute whether, um, again, <clears throat> you could say that complex machines, not atomic, you know, clocks um, are going to behave the same way as rudimentary matter under a circumstance where change takes place. So I think the changes in something complex are going to be a lot more complicated than the changes that take place in something that's as simple as decay. Well, as you know, we use atomic clocks as our most accurate clock. Yeah, I, I'm not talking about its accuracy. I'm talking about what causes. I'm saying something physical changes when you um, move something. When something has velocity, it means it has an imbalance of force inside of it. And it's changed. We know what causes these effects. And I don't think you do. Ampere's law, uh, Lenz's law, and Lorenz's. So um, it's Lenz's law that causes the relativistic effects. Well, yeah. it's kind of the Lenz's law is not a physical phenomenon. That's like saying, I don't know, it's even worse than saying Heisenberg. That's, it's a mathematical um, description of the effect. It's not a description of the cause. No, Lenz's law is an empirical law. What we it's observe. a description of effects. It's not a description of cause. Lenz's law has nothing to do with causes. Cause is something you never know. <clears throat> well, of course we can. That's what we're doing. We're just that's what the whole subject of physics is: is to find the causes. But but Lenz's law, if you if you follow the advice of Isaac Newton in his. Uh, uh, mathematical principles of natural philosophy. You see that the way to make progress is you perform as many experiments as you can, find as many empirical laws as you can, then solve them all simultaneously to find the more general solution. Uh, yeah, well, Newton wasn't really good at causes either. The whole point, in my opinion, is to find the causes, is to describe it with a model what is physically happening. I believe it's a physical universe. I think physics is about a physical phenomenon, and I think there's physical phenomenon that take place. There's a reason why, okay, the muon decays slower, a physical reason. Sure, the binding energy is increasing as you... Well, the binding energy doesn't say anything about... Uh, how how it's increasing. So saying the binding energy is increasing doesn't say anything. I'm saying that it's like a, I would use the analogy that if I, if you're dancing as fast as you can in one place, and then I ask you to move to your left, you can't dance as fast. So the processes that take place inside the atom are changed by velocity and that the velocity requires them to use time to move. Moving takes time. Therefore, the atom can't do what it was doing before because it gets fast because it now has to spend some portion of its time moving to the left. Well, in the case of something like the muon, you know, um, you have the decay products and the decay energy. You can measure all these things. So you, you know more than you're giving credit. I'm sorry, you don't know anything about causes. So you keep saying we know more. We don't know anything about the internal functions of a muon's decay. Well, you should you should uh, you should uh, look at what the people who who developed the empirical laws of. Yeah, I have looked at what they <laughs> developed models out of, and they, they, they developed said, models out of shadows, they said, <coughs> mere glimpses. They said nobody knew what the direct consequences, and then they come up with whole new theories. Was and so we don't know those fundamental questions. So we never have. So, well, I know they have the wrong guesses, is my point. And my point is, is they could have better guesses, okay, if they were a little more rigid in, in demanding a little bit more evidence before they make proclamations about time being a dimension. Time is not a dimension. You can't warp it or bend it. Yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's an assumption of, of special and general relativity, but it's not an assumption of... Uh, uh, the empirical laws in electrodynamics. They don't make that. Work. Again, I don't want to argue laws because number first, they're not actually laws. I mean, most of them are rules that you know have exceptions. Um, and regardless, again, the 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 fact that there's relationships between variables, that is, how hot something is, how how much mass it has, or how fast it's moving, and certain outcomes, uh, in my opinion 
is not doing physics, okay? Describing effects is not physics. Physics is trying to deduce causes from experiments on effects. So you see effects and then you try to deduce what's causing the effect. That to me is the science of physics. Well, do you know of anyone who's practiced it in a way? <clears throat> well, I'm just saying that I'm just, there's no point in calling it physics if it's not going to be about that, in my opinion. It's then it's just about, um, you know, just make up uh, any God theory will do. Well, is that this difference between, you know, being able to ex provide the empirical uh, data versus explaining like how that actually works? Because as Bill points out, you know, we do have data on muons, and this is where we get the uh, time dilation <coughs> yeah, but don't uh, we have results to... from. But, but we don't data... necessarily know what causes that. Isn't some of the data, though, very suspect? Like I could argue the two-slit experiment math is generally close to the right answer, but it isn't explicitly correct. So with photons, the math doesn't actually... Um, duplicate uh, the predict the outcome because in photons the bands of light do not have the gradient they're supposed to have from light to dark so the math isn't even explicitly correct and for the two slit experiment it's almost silly math because they don't have the width of the slit in the math which you know kind of gives it away as being a generalization and not really having anything to do with doing explicit dissection. So a lot of math isn't complete. So you could argue that Newton's math is really good, but it's only a 98% math, right? I mean, 2% isn't accounted for because he didn't have enough variables to know that there's these little tiny effects that are also influencing gravity. And so it's close math, but it's not perfect math. Let's see here. So I've asked uh, Abbas Jack where was his sources was, and he has pointed new to me at this paper by Stephen Bryant. So let me share that with you. So can you guys see that? This is a paper by Stephen Bryant. And he's referring to the 1905 relativity paper. And he begins this derivation here. Well, isn't it the same um, basic equation as the equation for the time dilation? I mean, or isn't it just basically the same proportional amount of change in the sense that you have more change the closer you get to the speed of light? So it's the same basic concept right that the contraction takes place at the same proportions as the time dilation well what i'm having a problem with is what's with this x minus bt specific term in here because if i looked at the wiki for time dilation that's definitely not the length contraction formula The length contraction formula is this thing here, which is length equals original length times the square root of one minus b squared over c squared. So that is the true length contraction formula. And uh, if you plug some numbers into here, like if the, the, the velocity is half the speed of the speed of light, which would make this b squared minus c squared 0.5, then the square root of 0.5 would say that the length is uh, 0.7 times the original length. So the length is in fact a contraction and not an expansion. So according to Wiki, then yes, this, this is definitely a length contraction, but this is not the same uh, formula as is given by this paper by um, by Stephen Bryant. So 
the question is, you know, Abhishek, are you just misinterpreting what the length contraction is? Because this is whatever this is, it's not the length contraction formula. So, but uh, Abhishek, you can you can comment in the chat. So, if you have a response to that, then please let us know. But I'm saying that as an objection to uh, what you had said, that you simply don't have the length contraction formula correct which I think was the, probably the most likely reason. Now wait for a response. Abacek. So Sam Wise and Harry are both having problems with hearing the speakers. So, but I, I can hear Bill and Draft Science. And but uh, so Sam wise, I see that you don't even have a microphone, so I don't believe your your system is is connected properly. We seem to be having a lot of challenges here. Yeah, I can hear everything so far. Okay, the only time there's a problem is when the um, Abacek guy is playing with his mic or making that static sound. You know, you can't hear anybody else when that's happening. You know, the sound canceling cuts the person off. I think I should just the sound the exit and come back in. Yeah, I did watch your um, presentation at the CMPS thing, frankly, on the protons and neutrons binding stuff. Mm -hmm. I do have a comment on that if, you know, later, if that's appropriate. No, you yeah. might as well go ahead now. What, uh, okay. what well, What's I, your comment on that? Yeah, I like the idea of it. I mean, I thought about it myself a few times trying to engineer atoms that way. Um, and But, you know, I realize there's also a ton of um, problems um, with any change you make to the existing theory um but what i thought of was the alchemy kind of issue that if 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 you were actually um if you actually had protons and neutrons throughout the atom then essentially you could break pieces of an atom off and it would be a separate element you know what i mean it would have all the constituents of being a separate element and so in a sense splitting atoms would be really easy because all you'd really have to do is knock pieces off and you could knock, knock a piece of lithium out of a piece of radon you could just knock a piece of gold out of the lead kind of thing you could just you know break the atoms really easily into separate um, um, pieces that would stay keep their structure and the whole thing that makes alchemy difficult is the fact that you also you have to change the nucleus as you change the stuff on the outside and that's what makes it so difficult to morph one atom into another atom well, actually, I mean, I have some interesting information about that. And, you know, you're right that we don't think that it's easy to, tra to transmute elements because we think there's this strong force. But, of course, I'm saying that there is no such thing as strong force, that the only thing that's holding the atom together is electrostatics, which means that it ought to be a whole lot easier to do transmutations. You know, uh, the way we do it with vision... When we when you have found that out already, though, then I mean, if it was easier, then we would have already accidentally fell on the easiness of it. So that's sort of what I'm arguing is that if it if it were true, I think it, it we would have already been able to do this. They would have been able to do it 200 years ago. Uh, well, actually, curiously enough, that's one of the things I do know, which is that it is actually easier. You know, you've heard about all this cold fusion stuff, and uh, the easiest cold fusion experiment you can do is to take two carbon rods and spark them together. So that's just a little bit of electricity going through two carbon rods. Now if you do this carefully, and I have done this carefully, um, you will find that the, the element, the magnetic element iron will appear when you're doing this. So, and the theory is that uh, carbon and iron are actually uh, carbon and oxygen are actually fusing to form iron. And the only reason why it forms iron is that because that's just the easiest element that we can detect, um, you know, without using a spectrometer. 
uh, the magnetic elements are, are very few. So if you do get something that's actually magnetic out of that, uh, you can be pretty sure it, it is it is iron. But this has been done by like the Texas A&M University and with spectroscopically pure carbon. And they analyzed all the results and they get a bunch of elements in addition to iron as a result of this uh, sparking process. Well, I know, but aren't those, so, th th those are, those are like um, oxides of, um, no, they're not oxides. You know, when they spectroscopically analyze the results, it's like the increase in iron is like 300 times or 400 times. It's some massive amount that can't be explained as a chemical reaction. They actually are transmuted. That the transmission, I'm just telling you that, that almost anyone can do this experiment where you can transmute carbon and oxygen to make I, iron. Yeah, I, I guess what, what I'm saying, though, is that you're not breaking carbon into simpler pieces. You're making more complex um, atoms. Yes, you're making the more complex things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess my, my argument is, is that it should be easier to do it the other way around. It should be easy to take the big thing and knock it into small bits, not make, you know, you're still this you know well i mean it does work both ways but i'm just saying both have a different limitation on how easy it should be so i'm just saying the simplest idea is the idea of breaking something not making something so my argument would be that the one that should be really easy is the smashing part if the protons and neutrons weren't stuck in a nucleus Well, yes, that's kind of an do, opposite. Uh... Go ahead, Bill. The, if the binding, the binding energy of the larger nucleus is, is stronger than the than the smaller ones, then your your own it's going to be a one way process for the most part, because the uh, the bind the different binding. And I showed in my talk at the uh, conference that uh, the binding energy, the magnetic binding energy, is the strongest part of the binding energy of the nuclei. And uh, the uh, binding energy changes with shell size. So the when you have the larger shell sizes, they have a stronger binding energy. So iron's going to be more strongly bound than these the two atoms that you are combining together to get iron. And, and so it won't go. You won't be able to break the iron apart as easily as you could put those together. Yeah, well, I don't think that's true. I think you can certainly break heavy nuclei pretty easily um <clears throat> but well, i do um, that for a living so i think i know a little bit more about it well you can say things like that that's fine i don't you know that doesn't mean anything to me um but fine i do the experiments oh uh, yeah i do experiments on accelerators these aren't photographs you take of anything okay i'm arguing with the whole theory behind particle physics this idea that you're going to make a whole new particle invent a whole new particle because you think its speed isn't the right speed, not because it's fundamentally different, but because, oh, it, it spins down a little faster than it should. Therefore, we have to call it a new particle when, no, it could just be a proton. You're just calling it something new because you think a little change in speed means it's a whole new particle. Well, when, when we have a reaction that occurs in an accelerator, we can detect all kinds of particles with high resolution. No, you don't. You do see a trail in a, in a in material substance. You have to create a fog, and you have to see how it changes. It creates well, photons that are emitted cloud. from the trail. The the, the traces you're, you're seeing about a cloud particle. We don't use that anymore. We use oh, thousands well, of, it, of detectors, and they detect high resolution data. We use a computer to combine it all, so we can see what. And, 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 and well, what does the detector use? What how how do you detect? particles without using a medium for them to travel but you, you're still looking at the ghostly trails of the particles you're not looking at any oh, actual yeah, particle. All kinds of particle detectors they're crystals and when something goes through them light or a part charged particle it puts off uh, uh, photons and other waves in the crystal and we can detect that immediately and yeah uh, again again uh, I'm, I'm saying they're all mediums isn't a crystal a medium? Right, but what it says so it's so much more. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a still a medium. It's still a cloud of a cloud detector. 
Well, it's not the position you have a greater authority, then sure. fine. I'll, I'll, I'll concede you have a right to claim authority. I'm just saying that I don't think Einstein was right. So if I can sit there and say, uh, you know, in straight faced words, I think Einstein was fundamentally stupid. Um, you know, on the subject, he doesn't know, he didn't know anything about particle physics, in my opinion, because he got everything wrong. There's no bent space. Time is in a dimension. Um, you know, this, this whole mush is just that it's made up mush. So if I'm challenging Einstein, why can't I challenge you or particle physics or the people at CERN? Well, see, the, well, some, some people at CERN have to make politically correct, uh, appeals or they can't get more funding. Yeah, well, everybody has their own agenda. I mean, you're you're a creationist, right? Well, by yeah, by background, but that doesn't mean that my physics is uh, slanted in that direction. And what I what you see? Didn't say it did. I just asked the question that everybody has an agenda. So I'm saying that often creationists have agendas. They have an endpoint they're trying to get to, which is God. Oh yeah. Uh, verification. A lot of the. Uh, a lot of the creationists don't like my work because it's critical of their non-critical thinking <laughs> and they're uh they don't like that but uh well, it's not my point my point is is that everybody can be suspect in terms of their biases so if you're going to claim the particle physics or just particle physicists are just doing it for the money i don't think that's true i think they really believe the mush they're preaching i, I well, don't think they're just saying i'm this. just going to tell the people what when, they want to hear when they were finding the higgs boson why did 15 of the 17 principal investigators say, no, we didn't find it. And two said yes, and they took the two. Well, that's your claim. So again, I, no, that's I, not I, my I'm claim. sorry that's to say, I'm sorry to say that the, the paper was signed by 3,500 people at CERN. So I don't know exactly which ones are the important ones and which ones aren't, but I would think that would have made the newspaper. Are listed if, on if, the if, 15, if 15 of the top investigators claim that they didn't find it, I think they would have stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, keep putting the, quit putting that in the paper that we found it because we don't think so. That's what they said. That's what they said. Well, I'm just saying, so, whatever. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doubting uh, the veracity of that as being a complete truth. Well, you can, but it was published that way. It was in the, it was in the physical journals and things of that sort. And, uh, so, yeah, well, I just I'd like to see the site. Well, uh, getting back to our point here, <laughs> uh, what exactly was the point here? Uh, so, uh, well, well, draft just, science was just pointing out that uh, you know this is this is that this is how we look at the reactions, and even in our more complex, like I have a picture of the LHC here. This is a picture of one of their results. You know, it looks like a cloud chamber. Now, Bill was just saying that, you know, we don't use cloud chambers anymore. But I think that point is pretty mute since it basically works the same way and produces the same kind of picture. So I don't know why you're arguing about that. They have 10 tons, they have 10 tons of, of instrumentality that detects these energy changes. So obviously they're doing it through lots of different mediums. So, you know, they have, you know, it goes through lots of stages of technology um but i'm just saying yes the, the basic rule is we can't see photons we can't see electrons we have to see what they cause something else to do we can only see the photons the electron is uh, uh, obligates to be released we can't see the electron we can only see the photons so, moving so is produces. that your point because because i think that 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 track is a pretty good uh proxy for that particle and studying it, right? It's not like that's useless information because that's not a picture of the photon. Oh, no, that I would never say it's useless information. information. I'd never say it's useless information, but we're talking about doing really exact definitions of something speed. Now, I would argue that if you can only see a train based on how it plows through jello, right? So we can only see the train based on the, the trail it leaves in a bunch of jello. My argument would be that what's going to happen to that train in terms of its velocity is going to be changed by it plowing through jello. So by creating the very thing that we're seeing it through, it is being affected. So our test instrument is in fact affecting the thing we're looking at. So again, it's that problem of, 
of instrumentality that you're disturbing the environment of the object you're trying to test. So we're back to the two slit experiment using detectors and there's no way you could detect this. You know, you can't bounce a photon of a photon. You can't tell what slit the photon went through. If you do it to an electron, you disturb the electron so much that there's no way to tell which slit it went through because you disturbed it too much. So I'm just arguing that this is a huge disturbance to the um, electron when it's passing through a medium. So let's not pretend that the effect of the medium, it, we're not seeing the electron in its natural state, in its free state. We're seeing the electron in a state where it's being encumbered by a sea of jello. Well, I could agree with that. I mean, it's like certainly uh, this, its velocity could be changed and certainly they deliberately put magnetic fields in there to cause these particles to deflect. So there's no, probably, I would agree, there's nothing terribly natural about the observed trajectory. I mean, it might be pretty close to the, the unperturbed direct trajectory, yeah, but it, it, it may last a lot longer. Um, that sort well, of thing the for these kind of detectors. The whole, the whole existence of a positron is based merely on the fact that they think the thing they're seeing is moving too fast to be a, a proton. So it looks just like a proton. It behaves pretty much just like a proton, except it's too, too fast to be a proton. So that's the, 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 the little bit of information for which their whole creation of a new particle is based on, is merely the fact that they're saying protons can't go this fast. Delay. Well, you know, uh, I, I would argue that we don't have enough information to draw a conclusion that it's not, that, that there isn't something happening to the proton that makes protons capable of slowing down that much or moving that fast or retaining that much speed, let's put it that way, that protons might be able to go through lead without losing that much speed. Well, that's kind of pushing up, but we do notice that that uh, they, they go as fast as electrons. So we do know that there's a direct comparison between those two and that, you know, a proton is still perhaps something different because we think that the electron and the, and the positron are just the antimatter equivalents. And well, I, that, no, that, that, everything we can measure about a positron is equivalent to an electron, other than the charge. Yeah, right. But I don't think they're exact in first, I would argue, and second, uh, exact reciprocals of each other. And then second, you have the problem where, um, you know, many of the physicists argue that the antiparticles are not real particles, they're vacuations in space where you took something out of a place and therefore you left a void where it used to be in terms of an electrical void, you know, electromagnetic void. And, um, you know, so, you know, so for them, uh, antiparticles are abstractions, um, you know, not, not reals. And so, so, I mean, th there is some question about the creation of actual, these actual particles. And I would argue that it doesn't, to me, just can't make any sense because we already know what's creating mass and atoms and it's just kind of silly to say there's a bunch of antiparticles all over the place because where's their mass then why why don't why don't they reveal themselves any other time except when we accelerate stuff and smash it together where's their role otherwise they don't seem to have a role they don't play any role except to show up in accelerators Well, I mean, I suppose that's the whole question of why is it we don't have so much antimatter around. We certainly, we can, we can create a beam of positrons. That's something which is commonly done. And uh, that would kind of argue against the fact that these uh, positrons are like evacuations, I suppose. Um, no, they, they okay, okay. So, okay, so uh, look, I'll look up the positron beam because that's not what it is. The, the positrons are created in the, in the place you're sending the beam. So they send a beam of protons, and they get back uh, positrons. I don't know. I don't think that's right, but we could look that up. I think that's how, how they the make medical positrons. device works, the, the positronic whatever it's called, the positronic imaging whatever, blah, blah, blah. I think the basic idea is it sends the energy into the body in, oh. in a regular form. And um, because of the reactive agent they put inside the person, 
uh, it uh, creates these high energy positrons and then they create an effect in the body that creates the new radiation that they're detecting. Well, I think that's true, but I don't believe that that's the, I'm talking about positron well, really there's a beam. real positron generators used by, by accelerators. I don't think you can make a beam of positrons. So I, I don't think there's any such thing as a positron gun, like an electron gun. Well, at, in accelerators, we make positron beams all the time. Well, again, I should say so, again, positrons by what definition? The, you, you, make, you make things that have a positive charge, like a proton, that are just uh, have less mass than a proton. No, wait a minute. If we have a cyclotron and we have a beam of positrons in there, uh, you have to adjust the energy of the that you're putting into the cyclotron or you lose your particle and you have to know the mass of it because if you don't get the mass right, you, you lose the particle. Uh, look, I understand the, the rules of accelerators. I'm just saying you're saying that you're accelerating positrons. First, I'd say you're not accelerating positrons. You're accelerating protons. So the magnetic moment of the particle. The, the, the whole, the, the, the Hadron Collider, uh, all right, it, it, is, it accelerates protons. It doesn't accelerate positrons. It accelerates protons. But the protons are banged into something like carbon, and you make all kinds of particles, and then you filter them out to get the kind you want. They're not accelerated, is my point. You said that the positrons are accelerated. I'm saying that doesn't the Positron, happen. you take protons, you bang it into something like carbon, and you make all kinds of particles. You filter out the positrons, and you put them into a cyclotron and then you perform experiments with them. I, I'm saying that there's no such thing. So you can say that happens, that that doesn't happen. There's no, well, I've done there's it. no positron I've done accelerator. It. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's sorry, I'm sorry. Well, okay, go ahead and say it. I'm just saying, no, there's no such thing as a positron accelerator. Sure. There's plenty of them. They're all over the country. Los Alamos has them. No, I'm, no, I'm sorry. So I happen. have an article here. Says physicists create most intense operating positron beam ever. So I would imagine that those words would imply that we do have positron beams. They're of varying intensity, and these guys managed to create the most intense positron beam ever. Okay, so you're reading the headline. Um, fine. I, I, I'm saying. Uh, and it comes from they're generating this thing from nuclear reactors. I mean, not unless you're saying that, that this entire article is bunk, you know, uh, but I would, I would, you know, they, they have measured beam rates of five to six times the 108 positrons per second. I mean, uh, if they didn't exist, I don't think they could measure them. Well, what do you mean? How, how do they measure them? How do you measure a positron except to measure it exactly the same way you measure a proton <clears throat> based on its charge? No, you well, are you saying this entire article is bunk? <laughs> I'm saying the whole point of positrons is bunk. So, of course, I'm saying the whole article is bunk in the sense that they're just using the word positron for a proton. They're just calling a proton a positron. Well, I think there is substantial differences between protons and positrons. The only difference is its speed. No, it's mass. Well, they would say like well, the mass same thing, is very mass and speed are the same thing when you're considering accelerating something. It's, just, it's the same conversation. You're talking about how much energy it takes to move a proton, and you're saying it's a positron because it takes less energy to deflect it. No, it takes a considerable difference between a proton and a positron because in a cyclotron, if you get it just slightly wrong, you lose your beam. And <laughs> by well, I'm arguing again about what gets accelerated in cyclotrons, but it's not positrons. It protons. Is. We can accelerate positrons. We can accelerate, yeah, accelerate uh, positive protons. kaons, positive uh, pions. We can do all yeah, kinds yeah, of No, no, no. Mm -hmm. None of that stuff can be accelerated, but whatever, fine. Uh, yes, I, okay, go ahead. Believe believe what they tell you, that these, all these little particles exist and they're all playing a role somewhere. But frankly, it's just garbage. There is no 175 different little crappy particles flying around. When I got my PhD thesis, I made pionic atoms, muonic atoms, 
chaotic atoms. Right. You named definitely the, different. You, from named, you named atoms. something something. You didn't make anything. You you named a phenomenon. Okay. You named an outcome. Just like they named the two split slit experiment Copenhagen. Just like they they named the concept of it doesn't know where it is uh, Heisenberg. I mean, these are just um, definitions based on scant evidence. So, okay, you we believe them. It's okay. evidence. You can believe it. I'm not saying you don't have to. You, you can go ahead and believe it. We measured it. all of the emission spectral lines of the different pionic, kaonic, muonic atoms. Spectral lines of a, of a, of a, a, a glorified electron. So electrons no, have a no, spectral we're, line. We were measuring hundreds of spectral lines from one atom at mm -hmm. a time. And that was in a highly excited state. You, you you don't know what's going on. You're not reading the the journal articles. You don't. Oh yeah, I've I've read. I've looked. I've looked for the evidence. Is what I've looked for. I've looked for the evidence of these things. And the like again, the only evidence they have for the existence of the positron is the fact that it went through a piece of lead too quickly. That's their evidence. It, it went well, through what the lead too mm, quickly to be evidence? a proton. Therefore, it can't be a proton because it went through the lead too quickly. Well, what about the evidence that if they take what they think is allegedly a positron and they react it, put it in the presence of uh, what they know is an electron, uh, that thing, quote unquote, annihilates. Uh, now, of if course, the positron course, protons was actually... Protons and electron electrons was, have opposite charge. Of course, they combine. They the electron, annihilate. If the electron, if the positron was the same thing as a proton, it would have formed a hydrogen atom. No, or it would have formed a neutron, or it would have formed a neutron. Uh, no, protons and electrons strictly form hydrogen atoms. They do not says form you, neutrons. Says you. Okay, we says can you. do that. We can take protons. What does a neutron decay into? What neutron decays neutron into a proton and an electron. Okay, there you go. Plus what else? Which I also explained. <laughs> I mean, a neutron, a neutron, at least a free neutron, is just a positron and electron, and then it reacts with another positron well, so you're electron saying it's a positron from so you're not, the C. So you're changing the name now again. So you're saying they're wrong to think that a, a neutron is made out of an electron and a proton. You're saying a neutron is made out of a positron. Uh, yes, that's 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 incorrect. Yeah, right, a, a right. neutron, in 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 my conception, would be made out of a positron and an electron strictly. Right. Well, I haven't even discussed any of my interpretations of what the truth should be. But I'm just saying you're saying I now have to take you. You're saying they're wrong, so you're allowed to say they're wrong, but I'm not allowed to say they're wrong. I can I can cite you with 10 million articles and journals about mm -hmm. how there's no positron inside of a neutron. You say there is. They all say there isn't. Well, they don't really know what's inside. I okay, mean, if you ask so me, they say so there's, uh, there's quarks in there. Standard. I challenge the authority. I'm out of my league. You challenge it. It's okay. Well, what's being challenged here is the existence of the positron. So I firmly believe that there's enough experimental evidence that they are can be detected differently and have enough different properties to call them a different set of particles. And so I believe... Right. And I firmly believe that there's scant... Tiny that's my bit of belief that the, the whole existence is based on. Its whole existence is based on a tiny shred of, of nuance and, and there's, just, there's no hard evidence for existence at all. Well, except that they, you know, we, I just showed you articles about them producing beams of these things. Uh, they didn't produce. So, look, I, didn't I mean, read unless, the article. I will read the article. Okay, I, I saw the title of it. Um, I think, and uh, well, anyway, I'll play the video back, um, and and I'll I'll read the whole article, and I, I can debunk it. Okay, but I can't do it on the fly. I didn't read it, so I don't know what they're claiming. But you know, they. Now, use I think this words is what like you were talking about initially. Don't, they, they, they use words in titles that have nothing to do with the article, and you know that. So come on. I think this is also what you were talking about initially, which is this is this is proton beam therapy program. So these people know they're dealing with protons and not positrons. Yeah, well, I think they know the difference beam, about right. those but two. I'm just saying that obviously they use they also have an instrument called the positron something or other emitter therapy. So they have a positron emitter of some kind too. But it does again, it doesn't admit 
positrons it produces them in the body and the body then has a chain reaction that creates whatever too many electrons i mean it's another one of these these things where the byproducts are a lot different than the products they say that are causing the effect so again i'm arguing their definition of a cause i'm not arguing the effect i'm arguing the causes and the definitions of uh, what caused the effect well, this is probably closer proton therapy dosimetry using positron emission tomography so the tomography is being is, is detecting the uh, probably in the annihilation of the positron. By well, a PET image, the location of the positron emitter is in the patient. Therefore, the path of the proton beam can be determined. So they send in a proton beam. Those generate positrons. The positrons can be in, uh, detected by the... Annihil after they annihilate. The after they annihilate. Yes, the positrons annihilate. never are part of any of the inputs or the outputs. There's no positron as an output. There's no positron as an input. It's all part of the chain reaction of their speculation about what happens. That, that's not yep, right. Yep, that's the way it works. You know that picture you saw from uh, a CERN that you showed? Uh, do you, can you get that back? Uh, well, I, I think we know what the picture is. We all get it. It's those, a bunch of little everything things. you saw in that picture was due to different detectors. And that picture is created by a computer. That's not uh, looking through uh, a cloud chamber or something like that. Well, I, didn't I say that, though? Didn't I say that their detector is 10 tons of instrumentality that they're detecting with lots of dif different instruments measuring lots of different things? So I already conceded that point, but it, they're okay. all, they <laughs> all require a medium to give you photonic results. They're all measuring basically photonic trails Okay. that are created as chain reactions. But just look at the dots. Those are all different detectors. They're detecting certain things. The 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 things that Other are differences are like the lines there. Those are not from a cloud chamber. Those are from detectors and they're detecting uh, both directions and they can they can draw the line because that's what their detectors are showing. And uh, so um, they put all of that together in this picture, and and I would I did the computer programs to do that when I, I was working at the Space Radiation Effects <clears throat> Laboratory run by the College of William and Mary, and uh, we had the most advanced accelerator center in the world for 15 years because we had the first we were the first accelerator center to have that capability. All right. Well, just just for the audience's sake, let's just understand that we can't even hit an electron with a photon without substantially disturbing it. And the only way you can see something, the only way you can know it exists, is you have to throw something at it. And if you don't throw something at it, you're not going to know where it is. Or wait, what it's doing. wait a minute. That's not true. That's not true. Any charged particle that doesn't move in a straight line because you put a magnetic field on it must radiate continuously because it's being accelerated and why why are why is why is a magnetic field called by these very same physicists virtual photons why do they concede that that radiation called magnetism is in fact something comparable to a bunch of photons being shot at it that's exactly what electromagnetism is it's described in the mathematics that way. It's a bunch of rays of force, which are essentially photons. They call them virtual photons. Well, experimentalists don't do that. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I don't know. Engineers. Uh, what, what, what do you call them then? What do you call it? Magic then? You just say that the, the electron magically moves. Something doesn't actually have to hit it to move it? No, but you see, once it's in a field, you continually have the light the the radiation coming off and the radiation's direction is uh that you with a photon detector so you can detect it and by the way you the photon detector does not detect it doesn't detect steel it amplifies the effect of a photons on electrons okay so a photon detector is really amp is, is really detecting the vibrations created in electrons. It's creating an increase in voltage created by compressing electrons. So that's how we detect photons, is by seeing their effect on electrons. You can't see a photon any other way 
than to wait for it to hit an electron. That's the only way you can know it exists. We, we use liquid crystals and they, they're low temperature and uh, you know a couple degrees Kelvin and that's how we detect these things and uh, I think that uh, the way the detectors are designed they rule out these th effects that you are uh, okay I'm just saying for the audience benefit I'm just saying think about it that the only way we see anything is by having to uh, Im impose something onto it and see the reflections that come back and that's how seeing works and the same is true in physics nothing gives off magic stuff it all has to be something has to affect it and it's affected by something that's an actual real thing and so if you're detecting something that's very very small and you have to detect it with something that's kind of big by comparison to the small thing, okay, like a photon detecting an electron, um, the fact is you're going to completely disturb what the thing is by hitting it with, it's like seeing a Cadillac by hitting it with Volkswagens. It's, you're, you're not going to be able to see it in its natural state. You're going to see it in this condition you're imposing on it. Well, I don't think most scientists are going to agree with you and never say you're well, I don't agree with most scientists. So that that would that would certainly be fair because yes, yeah, I don't they're, think they're, they're they, gonna uh, say to you I don't think they have their not uh, rigorous. And they'll they'll say that's because they're not logical. And well, whatever. I they can say whatever they want. I just keep saying, Where's your where's your strong evidence? You, they they're making proclamations about reality and saying it very confidently, and their evidence is in putridly thin. There's 10 zillion tons of evidence for like the theory of evolution. It's established in many different disciplines, many geologically, biologically, genetically established. All right. Lots of, that I disproved the lots and lots of, of evidence. Evolution. And where's the evidence for all this nuclear you physics mum, 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 mumbo jumbo? Tiny pieces of evidence, way abstract well, pieces of evidence. Did you know that I have given the very definitive proof that evolution of life from non life has not occurred because yeah, well, it's okay. the that's your credibility. I'm that's one your credibility then. The okay. Life. Just take that for everybody just take that for what it is. Okay. He's denying all the evidence for evolution. Wait a minute. Let me finish saying I was one of the the developers of the experimental life energy meter, which you can purchase on the internet. No, I'm not and doing that. So that all the experiments that says that life comes from non-life cannot show any life energy they can show molecules uh, precursors of organic that's molecules. how evolution oh, works right. yes uh, electrons and protons aren't anything like atoms that's right the things that stuff is made out of isn't the same as the stuff the thing we're made out of living cells we technically aren't alive we're a community of living cells. So even the word alive doesn't mean much because we've called two things that are very different. It's like calling a building a city or calling a city a building. That wouldn't make any sense. We're made of living organisms. We're not a living organism, technically. We're a collection of living organisms. Right. So, uh, so, so that circular like, logic is a meaningless guys. argument. I don't want to get into religious arguments here, which is where this is heading. So, can we get back to physics? So, uh, I, I, I just answered, I just, I just I asked the question to you. Your, your presentation on electrons and protons, and, and so what, what, what makes you think, I, I guess it doesn't matter for the sake of your argument about the fact that the atom is spread out. So, uh, so you think they, that if, if, if it, so, so what is your argument for wouldn't if, if the if the neutrons and protons were completely through the entire atom, what is your counter argument to my argument that well then it would be made of a lot of um, helium and hydrogen and uh, you know lithium and all the elements would end up being essentially in big giant um, uh, like you know radioactive heavy heavy metals would be full of a bunch of these other um, atomic structures because you'd end up repeating the same patterns. I mean, the only way you make your big atom is by making it out of little atoms, essentially. Yes, okay, so you can see my video. 
So this is the geometric uh, shape that my atoms would form. Now, the thing is, is that they're very, very, you know, thin. They form this X shape. Now, effectively, all atoms are actually some combination of helium nucleuses. And this is typically referred to as like, I don't like the alpha model, because when, when you have radioactive decay, uh, what you typically have is you have alpha particles or helium nucleuses uh, fly off. Now, the reason for that is, is, like I say, all atoms are actually composed of some combination of helium nucleuses. Like if I break off this little piece here, that would be this little square block is a helium nucleus. And all um, Nobel elements are actually combinations of just pure helium nucleuses. Well, I know, but and that's chemical rudimentary form. So that's like saying that on, off, on, off again. So if you say a helium nucleus is a, 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 a if, if you put a proton next to a neutron, don't haven't you already established haven't we already established in in part well maybe we, we haven't if the neutron was let's just go with the standard theory if the neutron was an electron and a proton just very close together then essentially you've just created a pattern where you have proton electron proton and so that would be yeah the i mean that's essentially that, that is effectively what i'm doing right so that would be the most rudimentary element so of course everything else would be made out of that but my argument would be is that you would also have uh, elements of of complexity that would go further than that, um, but there, you know, like you could have a square, like you could have you could have an electron in the middle, and then you could have four protons, let's say, you know, some other arrangement that gets you the same result. Say 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 if it was a neutron, say you had one electron in the center, and then you had a proton, I mean a neutron connected at the four corners, you know, the four sides, let's just say. Um, then well, I mean, did I answer your question to... about, yeah, I can't about see you know, why is it? I, I can't I mean, see. Before you go on to something new, I want to see whether I answered your question about why is it that these things can fall apart and, you know, why don't they fall apart in in certain ways is what you're asking? Yeah, I'm just saying why it would be like you would just imagine you could break an atom really easily because it was basically made out of subatoms. So you, a bunch of subatoms would just fly off. And instead, what we see in fusion or fission is that when you screw with the atom, you end up with a bunch of tiny energy left over. Like if you're able to break the nucleus, you break it into a big clump of one thing, okay? and you end up with a bunch of energy as a result. And that's why nuclear power works is because you basically create a smaller element that com recombines um, and you end up with a bunch of energy left over or else you take two of something and put it in, you get one out and a bunch of energy left over. So it doesn't break into a bunch of atoms that just break into pieces, it breaks into a bunch of energy, which in my opinion implies that it's gotta be a lot more complicated than a bunch of atoms stuck together like molecules. Well, one interesting piece of atomic data you might want to look up is that when atomic fission does occur, um, the atom doesn't really break apart into, like, say, half. So uh, if you can see, I have this chart here that I got from hyperphysics. This is called an asymmetric um, uh, fission, and that basically the thing that it's least likely to break up into is half. So A equals 111, 118. That is actually the least likely thing for it to break up into. The most likely thing for it to break up into is uh, chromium at A atomic weight 95 and uh, barium, I think, is it? 137. So that's kind of weird. Why is it when we have fission that it breaks up into these particular pieces? Well, I think it does. So the reason why <laughs> those are the ones that are stable. So, I mean, uh, you, you, no, that's not true. That there's no there's no argument for stability here. There's a bunch of our elements. They're all actually all these elements are probably stable. There's not a stability argument to be made. You can't just um, you, can't, you can't just break lead into gold. So I'm just saying that the simple argument is you can't just knock off a couple of protons and then make a new element. So um, it has to break into. Well, some the question is. Why? Well, well uh, let me give you the question. Why would you assume 
that the nucleus wouldn't be symmetrical like everything else. Like we have two eyes and we have two brains essentially, and we have lots of two-ness happening. Yes, I mean, that's a good question because this thing of all the possible shapes you could form, you know, this is one would be one less obvious. I mean, why would it form into like this? Why wouldn't it just be a more concentrated, why couldn't it just be a, a, a cube, right? Because I could have clearly taken all these Legos and just arranged them into a cube and they would take up the same number of elements, right? But why this? Well, one of the motivations for this is that if you imagine if I took this and I threw this against a wall, you know, what's going to happen to it? The most vulnerable pieces that are likely going to fly off is like uh, one of these one of these uh, X's, like one of these X's. Tear off one of those X's is one of the most likely things to have happen, right? Or maybe tear off two of these X's. Uh, well, it, my, it's going to come off in basically one quarter pieces. I know, but isn't that an right? argument for my so, exact argument? That's a, that's an argument for my exact point. My point is that they do this with neutrons, so they they're you know the neutron it can it can affect an electron, but it's not going to create a chain reaction, so you'll never see it. So you could shoot neutrons at atoms all day, and you could be hitting electrons and knocking them out and creating ions and doing all kinds of stuff, but you'll never see them because there's no chain reaction, and you're only going to see it when you cause the chain reaction, that is when you hit the nucleus and the nucleus creates three more neutrons and those three neutrons hit nucleuses and create three more neutrons. And, you know, so you have this magnified effect. And so the only way you effectively start splitting atoms is by actually hitting something important. And it's, it seems clear there's something important in the sense that the, the nucleus itself breaks um, symmetrically. Well, it breaks, if the atom was shaped like an X, then you would expect that you would get a shape like shown in the graph. Now, the A equals 95 does equal the breaking off of exactly one of these arms. And the, 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 the second hump is what you would see if two of these arms were broken off. So that appears to be the most common possibility for, for fission. Either you break off one and it becomes a free piece, or you break off two. That is one motivation for why this is an X and not like a solid square. Well, I guess and once I again, you know, this is all built out of that same initial model where I showed you that where the neutrons and protons are glued together. Yeah, I know. But so that's how I explained that. So that's a good reason why you would want to have a geometric form. Yeah, I'm not against the square atom. I'm sort of against the idea that you just say the atom is the whole square because obviously, it's, in my opinion, it's not. It's the field being created. The electrical field is what's holding them together. So it's not an actual part of the electron. The electron's not the big, huge square in the Rubik's Cube or something. The electron is still just a tiny point and it's creating a field around it. It's charge field and it's charge field that's what's binding it to the other electrons and binding it to the protons and all that stuff so all the binding energy is still binding energy it's not an actual electron so you're sort of implying that the electron is a square and that the squares stick right next to each other when i think it's kind of clear that protons and electrons can be very different distances from each other you know i would in the case of the neutron i think they're right next to each other in the case of the helium uh, nuclei they're further apart from each other you know there's different distances the electron is from the protons and clearly electron pressure is voltage and clearly you can have higher voltages where they're further apart or I mean uh, closer together and further apart. Well, I don't think I would have any disagreement with any of that. I mean, I, right. I make so it this shape the, and they are the, the distance that they are away as a matter of convenience. <laughs> Uh, right, right. So Since I'm just I can't build it any other way. Right, do it as a metaphor, but just to point out that the actual bit would still be inside the square. You know, that its its force field is the square, and that the actual bit is just inside the middle of that little square, you know, something like that. Something to indicate the difference between the force that comes off of an electron and an electron itself. Yeah, but I think in most cases that's not going to substantially affect the geometry. The geometry that needs to be effective is this positive, negative, positive, negative kind of thing in, in this picture here. So this is, once again, the picture of the helium nucleus, which I believe becomes the basis for uh, the formation of all other atoms. I mean, the trick here is you have to figure out, you know, what is that, what is that neutron 
doing to act as a glue so that such that the neutrons and the protons are stuck in the atoms. But no matter how much energy you, you, you shoot at an atom, only the electrons generally come out. I mean, so, the, so that's what I was trying to explain, that, that there's a glue there. There's an electrostatic glue that allows one of the electrons to be free because it's not actually attached to anything because all the other pieces um, have their mates. But this electron is free uh, simply because it, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it doesn't find a mate inside this particular structure. Because actually, for a while, I couldn't really explain this myself you know why why this why this structure actually glues together why is it that the protons and neutrons are bound and uh, that's just the way i came up with it so that's another reason why i think the neutron is just a positron and an electron i mean for a while i didn't know whether i thought whether a neutron was a proton and electron for a, a long while apparently i thought it was um or whether whether a neutron was actually two positrons and two electrons is another possibility. Um, but yeah. finally, because because of like the, the way that it's required geometrically uh, in a physical model, that the, that the neutron can only have a single positive and single negative charge represented by the positron and the electron. Yeah, that, well, that's how I came to that conclusion. Uh, yeah, well, I have a, uh, another. You know, from my own theory, I can sit there and explain how. The strong force is really a weak force because the the electron mitigates the is is actually the you know their attraction between the protons. The protons end up close together because there's an electron in between them. The electron is attracting both the protons, obviously, if you want to use that vernacular. So that's the strong force is just the fact that you have an electron that's channeling the positive repulsive forces and converting essentially the the, the repulsive forces between the protons into an attractive force between the protons. But regardless, the other problem with the square geometry, obviously, is that you end up creating diagonals and it kind of it kind of blows in the face of the inverse square law. So you end up losing the fact that these things do radiate force proportionally. There's not like one direction where it has more force and less force in another direction. So I don't think there's any evidence that electrons have spikes in their um, charge, you know, that they're charged more at the corners and charged less at the, uh, you know, at the sides. And so square geometry, you know, has that weakness in the sense that it would end up creating strong and weak charge areas. Well, that's actually my whole basis for how chemistry works. So I have a picture of nitrogen here. So this nitrogen is created from two helium nucleuses. Those are shown in the middle and to the right. And then we have unequaled, then we have these are ba just basically half a helium nucleuses on the bottom and the top and left. This creates asymmetry. And so the, the, the helium nucleuses are still uh, non-chemically reactive. So the right-hand side, chemically non-reactive. Uh, yeah, but well, the top, I mean, bottom, I mean, and the left are chemically what? reactive because they're asymmetric. So, I mean, that that's how that's why nitrogen binds to three I, I, atoms I and, and that. generally a triangular. I wasn't arguing that atoms aren't asymmetrical. I'm arguing that electrons can't be. That charge. Yeah, electrons, like I said, I would agree that they are spherically symmetric. Right, so they can't be and uh, that together. that if, if if it helps you, I mean, if, if these were made out of spheres instead of Legos, would that help you? Well, I'm just saying, could I, be. I, 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 yeah, I, I'm just saying that they can't really fit together any other way. I, you know, so I'm just saying it's not that it would help me. I'm just saying it would be more accurate. So that's all I'm saying. So you can, you know, I, I'm not nitpicking. I'm just saying that visually this looks more binding than if you did do it in circles. So if you did do it in circles, then it doesn't look quite as binding. I'm not still not quite sure if I understand your your point here. I mean, you're trying to. Well, if obviously circles, it, it sounds more like a, a nitpick than a, a, than a real problem. Space. Obviously, circles will create a lot of empty space. That is space that won't be occupied by the charge or by a particle. So, because circles won't fit together in you know right next to each other perfectly, they won't fit together in this kind of way. Circles will have to fit together 
you know, uh, on edges, and there'll be a whole part of the uh, a whole part of the atom that will have nothing in it, so to speak. Circles will create more less efficient, um, co less compact atom. Correct. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, clearly you can fit a circle inside of a cube. Um. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, if I stuck a bunch it's, of circles together, I'm just saying, if I make anything with circles next to each other, stuck to each other, there'll be a bunch of space that won't be filled with the circles. There'll be non-circle space. And and is that a problem? I, uh, it's, I, I already said it's not a problem for me if you're going to argue in the context that this is a very loose metaphor you're using, just very loose. That it, that Because I'm just saying, it, obviously, Legos makes it look like it all sticks together really good when, no, you know, the stuff has to be stuck together with these equal forces. You can't have diagonal lines and you can't have a lot of these rules that you're kind of violating when you use squares, that's all. Well, I suppose, but I'm not sure if that's, I mean, we, you can get magnets, spherical magnets, and they lock together exactly like these Legos. <laughs> well, I know, but a square magnet also locks together the same way because it's the inverse square law kind of rule. And, you know, the, the you know, the, the, I'm not saying the shape is irrelevant. I'm arguing that there's no evidence. But I mean, I'm, I'm more interested no in, in the bigger issues. Not are square. So I'm just saying there's no evidence that they produce charge that has points. I've, yes, I've electrons it. are not square. That's I would totally agree with you. Like I said, it's it's a matter of convenience. It's a matter of this is the kind of software I have to to uh, render these things in. Right. And I'm um, saying that's but okay. it's. Uh, I just, I'm just for the sake of clarification, just pointing out that, okay, we're arguing this is a very loose metaphor, not a very uh, accurate metaphor. Yes, it's, it's loose. Okay, that's all. But the question is, is that, you know, did I, did I answer your questions about, you know, whether it's easy, whether this, this kind of model would make it easier to have transmutations or explain what happens during fission that would be explainable by this type of model. Let me put it this way. Um, if you built a big atom, like a radon or you know, uh, uranium or some kind of big atom, would you concede that that big atom would create geometries that would duplicate many other atoms, not just helium nuclei, not just uh, hydrogen, but that they would create the same exact pattern inside of them as, say, lithium or carbon or you know all the other elements that there would be physical geometry that would be an exact duplicate of that element so it would essentially contain uh, not with not inside let's see so i've got it's some other pictures i don't here. see how you, it's too simple it's all just black red black red black red i'm just saying that pattern can be made into um you know, that's why there's a hundred, only a hundred elements or whatever. <laughs> there's a certain confinement to how many ways you can arrange simple bits. There's only so much geometry you can possibly make. And I'm just saying there would be a redundancy in the sense that you'd end up with, you know, black, red, red, black, or red, 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 black, black, black. You know, you'd end up with these combinations that would be the same as other atoms. Not well, just. I mean, it definitely is. There, there is definitely an expanding geometry. So, like, I have a picture of oxygen, and then this, this, the, the X pattern just basically expands out. So you got fluorine until you got neon, which is still a flat X. But as you get to the larger atoms, like xenon here, uh, basically the neon is embedded inside of that. The blue part in there is actually the neon atom. So it expands out that way. I mean, does that kind of explain? Yeah, well, that's what I'm sort of the, neat, the Xeon atom is not is, is not made out of, say, a bunch of lithium atoms. Um, well, it's it's lithium atom is, is inside of there. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It's going to be made. There, there'll be parts of it that are essentially that element, and that means it'll still be reactive as that element. So we'd still have those properties, especially if it was on the outside of the atom it would still have the same properties as, say, lithium or something like that. And so 
I'm just saying, I think that would, this would become quite obvious because the properties of, of the, these higher elements would end up having the same properties as some of the lower elements. Uh, well, they do. I mean, according to like this particular shape, there are actually possible places uh, that chemistry can happen, top, bottom, and then the four sides. And I believe that holds true. And it, it depends on whether this, the, the very edges, tips here, form a complete helium nuclei or not. So, and as you go around and fill these things in, and that's why this is also motivated by this particular shape, you can see that let's, it's easier to see on simpler atoms, like oxygen, that it only has basically two incomplete helium nuclei. Now, if you get into a really gigantic atom, like you know, something the size of xenon, um, xenon, if, if two of its uh, arms at the edges here were incomplete, then it would have the same reactivity as oxygen. Right, and, and that's why that we actually have the period. I, I just think what, that would have been noticed. Well, here's another question. Um, well, we do uh, notice that. That's a, that's how the whole periodic table of elements is arranged. Well, I know, but we don't notice it as they're actually being a replacement for, you know, those elements. I mean, having similar properties and having the same properties is, you know, again, an argument of how, how, how much, how much of a, an effect there should be. And I'm arguing it should be obviously more of an effect if this was actually true. Well, but what about, look, what about the simple argument I made before about the fact that we know a nuclear reaction is sustained by shooting a neutron in and you disturb the atom's nucleus and you get three extra neutrons out. And so how would your box theory explain why just neutrons pop out? Why are these loose neutrons? How, how do you break off that much of the atom with one neutron? I mean, how do you shoot one neutron into one of these things and cause an effect that causes the whole thing essentially to to break down in such a major way that you lose three neutrons or free. Okay, now this is in, in part speculation, but here I have a uh, an argon atom. Now, where the neutrons fit into the atom are into the insides of the X's. Now I've studied this and the number of neutrons you can fit in does seem to correspond with the geometric locations which are actually available. So, you know, argon cannot take an infinite number of neutrons. It can take like, you know, I'm not sure whether I'm showing four here. I think I'm showing four pretty much and you can't stuff any more in. So you gotta imagine that uh, in a nuclear reactor, we have these neutrons flying around and uh, you know, initially they get broken off of the. Well, when that color coding, which thing is which? Broken what is off the, the atom. What is the white thing? What's the blue? The dark blue and the, the yellow. yellow. What? So the white that is the inside helium nucleus, and then the blue, um, I think that's basically the the neon atom, and then the outside the whole thing makes up argon. So you can see the atom builds up from inside layer to outside layer. The colors just indicate uh, what layer you're working on. So we've got helium, neon, argon. You can see that they are all built out of complete helium nuclei. They're just yeah, uh, and, you know, one of these things. Yeah, so I and that the yellows are neutrons. Yeah, I just don't see how you wouldn't be able to just blow that to pieces. Uh, so, so the yellows are the neutrons. So you have no neutrons connected to the dark blue elements. Uh, no, that does seem to be the limitation that the neutrons can only exist inside the, the, the intersections, that they can't not appear just arbitrarily. Well, I'm just saying, so you're saying that the dark blue stuff, which you said was argon or something, what was the dark blue? Well, those are the, the final the helium nuclei that form argon. This is an entire argon atom. Oh, well, I'm the whole to thing is an argon atom. So these blocks are all just helium nuclei, just painted different colors. Yeah, these colors? blocks are all just helium fused helium nuclei. Okay, so so the the so they're all just two protons and an electron, or two or a positron and an electron and a proton. Um, 
Uh, you know, I, well, anyway, yeah, so th that gets very confusing. So you're saying that somehow the, those outside helium nuclei don't have a neutron in them? Uh, no, the neutrons are not attached to those locations. Well, I mean, how can you have a helium nuclei that doesn't have a neutron? Well, the, these things, well, these are outside, these are extra neutrons. The yellow things, these are extra. Well, I don't know. Your how, two how, helium nuclei has two, pro, two, two neutrons. Well, I, that doesn't make any sense. So you're saying that there's extra neutrons we don't know about. They haven't detected. Well, definitely. I mean, we have, we have isotopes. So we have to account for where these uh, extra neutrons go. But, but the isotopes are either an added And why they don't account for isotopes reactivity. Are, isotopes are the addition of an electron and subtraction of electrons. It's not the addition and subtraction of neutrons. Uh, no, isotopes are the addition of neutrons, right? That's no. basic physics. You know that. No, I'm sorry. That doesn't make any sense. The neutron is essential. You have to have the, the, the neutrons. But, I mean, you know, you can... You, you, um, These are extra neutrons. Again, you're saying they're extra. I'm just saying four extra neutrons. Uh, wouldn't we know there was four extra neutrons? Uh, yes, we do. I mean, if you look at what the... I mean, let's just go look at web elements and you can see them, right? Uh, there's isotopes with four extra neutrons? Yes. Uh, 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 there's four extra neutrons and four extra in the latest possible four extra, four extra electrons i presume then uh no they're not four like so let's see let's we're looking at argon its atomic weight typically 18 because of 18 protons Let's go look at its isotopes. More, more properties. Uh, let's see here. Physical properties, atom sizes, isotopes, and NMR. OK, so these are the naturally occurring isotopes of isotope. So we have like. Uh, Argon 36, argon 38, argon 40. And then we have the radioisotopic data. Now the neutral one is uh, 18 times two. So we have isotopes which are missing. So we get 37. Yeah, we have well, up to 44 <laughs> actually. Not defining the isotope by number of neutrons. I mean, isotopes are traditionally defined by the number of electrons, right? An extra electron or minus electrons, right? No, you might want to take a look at that. It's it's defined by the actual mass. So you see the mass differs and greatly by like you know the the same weight as a proton. Neutrons and protons are effectively the same mass. And what is changing here is is that mass, and that is due to an additional neutron in the system. Well, okay, I, and I these, these are all argon. Traditionally, but... I, I, traditionally, all the other ions are based on electrons, so right. I mean, if you want to create an ion, well, no, we're not talking about ions. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that you're so familiar with physics, but you don't you don't know what an isotope is. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's. In my opinion, I would suggest I, you like to look change, at it. change in the cha charge of the atom. So that's that's how I understood it. But OK, fine. I mean, if, you, if you're saying there can be an isotope that you can throw away a neutron. OK, I'm not, fine. Yeah, well, that, that's what it is. Uh, if, if, if you doubt me, you can take a look at that. But that's very standard physics. But in any case, we're getting back to what happens in, 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 in atomic fission. Um, so you have the atoms, they have, I have neutrons on it, and neutrons are just bullets with kinetic energy. You hit, when you hit this, the, the, uh, the other atoms here, 
um, it will cause them to. Now the question is, why is it that, that the neutrons have to be slow? Because if they're too fast, um, the, the chain reaction doesn't happen actually. Um, so it's not that, so more energy is not good. Uh, my own feeling is, is that, and once again, this is speculation, is that the neutron has to hit the atom with enough energy to remove the electrons. Because uh, the, the, uh, originally these atoms are neutrally, are neutrally charged. But the way that you get these things to split is if you go and you start removing the, 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 the negative charges that are normally bound into this thing such that you leave it with a gigantic net positive charge. So if you knocked all the electrons out of this thing, that means that there's no balancing a negative uh, electrostatic force to hold this thing together anymore, and it will cause the atom to fly apart, and it will cause it to fly apart at its weakest point, which would be uh, like one of these, one of the X's, one of the X's will fly off. And yeah. the energy that we observe in these uh, atomic fission reactions is the repulsion of the positive charges. So it's really a Coulomb force that we're observing and not any kind of strong nuclear force. That's my well, speculation. I, I don't think there's any strong nuclear force, again, to be broken. So that doesn't even mean anything to me. But yes, um, all, the, all you're doing is releasing stuff that's in the atom that's just already pressurized. So that's what the voltage is. That's the pressure between the electrons is the only pressure there really yeah, is. Yeah, but the, I'm saying that when, the way you pressurize the atom, the way you pressurize the atom is by removing its electrons. So it's you leave unbalanced positive charges. Well, I know, but that would... You got to pressurize it somehow. You can't, you can't um, remove all the electrons because then there'd be nothing holding it apart together. The, every little bit would fly apart and you just end up with a bunch of protons. I mean, I'm just saying, uh, well, if effectively, there's no, electrons, if there's no electrons. All there is is the repulsive force of the protons, and then they'll just run away from each other. The electrons are yes, binds. and that's what they do. That's what I'm saying. What that's what exactly. Well, I know, but that doesn't happen. That's just what fission is. That doesn't happen, though. Sure, it does. That's what happens no, no, with fission. Only a tiny, only a tiny percentage of the atom is destroyed. The atom is basically just turned into another atom. So you're just taking some of the atom and you're breaking the nucleus, making it smaller. Uh, uh, and so you convert uranium into whatever, barium or something. I can't remember exactly what you convert it into, but you're converting it into another um, atom. And you're, the leftover is the leftover. Yeah, so I would think That's we totally agree on that. Right, so you couldn't have removed all the electrons because then you, you wouldn't be able to- No, you don't remove all electrons. You, you just remove enough. Well, I don't. I don't. And once enough has been removed, why? It's... Why do you think removing electrons is how the thing works when you're shooting a neutron in? Because it doesn't we can remove electrons with electrons? We can just hit something with electrons to kick electrons out. Yes, so that that is one of my predictions, which is that if you just took uranium gas and you like just put it in a very strong plasma, you would find that the decay rate would rapidly increase. That would be one of my predictions. Yeah, well, I, I think in a, anything in a plasma is going to decay, but, uh, you know, fine. Uh, you know, I, I don't, electricity is a, a violent event for many atoms, So, you, but you're just knocking stuff off the periphery. I don't think you're going to start creating alchemy that way. I mean, I don't think you're going to create a, a, a chain reaction that way. Well, a chain reaction is just a matter of just uh, getting enough energy out of the initial reaction to cause another reaction. And that's what a chain reaction is. And obviously you have to balance it so that it, it keeps on going. So I don't know that that's a real objection. I mean, that's just a, a physical, you know, practical thing. Well, I guess how, it's many, just how, how many reactions you get going before it's self-sustaining. Um, right, but there's still players i'd say in atoms that are bigger players and less, lesser players so i would argue that the protons are more rigidly held or more massive however you want to look at it so it's more energy to move a proton than it takes to move an electron you know so it does kind of matter what you're hitting and what you're hitting it with so 
I you know I still tend to argue that if neutrons um, were in out on the outside of atoms, we have <laughs> real evidence of that. I mean, in the sense that that would be stronger binding energy. I mean, the only way you can connect. One well, I don't know is, about. There, 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 isn't the way all the chemistry works is that you're binding based on the absence or presence of an electron, right? I mean, all atoms bind to each other based on electrons, not based on um, connection to um, either the absence or presence of an electron, not you know through the fact that there's an exposed not neutron yes neutron that, that's true i mean basically proton i mean, you I mean all any... the isotopes of oxygen can, are chemically uh very similar so the question is you know why why is it that the neutron even though it adds significant mass does not involve in chemistry so that's another motivation behind this particular model because it allows you to hide the the neutrons um, in these non-reactive corners, right? The, it, it, so the neutrons can hide in there, and they wouldn't necessarily interfere with the formation of uh, of other elements. Yeah, I mean, of uh, other oxygen, uh, compounds. Oxygen is kind of a poor example, though, isn't it? Because it's so asymmetrical to start with. I mean, it, that's why it's so reactive, is because it does have such an obvious polarity. You know where. It has an empty shell um, available for binding. So, you know, it, you don't make it isotopically more stable. You know, you can't. So all of its isotopes are going to be just more, un, just another version of the same instability. You can't make the oxygen through merely making isotopes more stable. So that's all it's basically saying is you can't fix the fact that it has a polarity merely by um, the range of change you can do through isotopes. Not enough of a change. Let's see. Now I have a response from Abichek here. So let's discuss that. Um, so I, I had said that um, the problem with uh, his assertion of a length contraction is that he's using the wrong formula. Now, he says that uh, the answer to uh, that contention is in his document. So I have a document he sent to me here, and I really don't see any reputation of that. I mean, he's got his, his equation here, which is x minus vt, and that is clearly not the length contraction formula. The length contraction formula is that which is stated in uh, the Wikipedia article I had cited. And so I have to say, Abhijek, I don't, I don't uh, see that that's at all um, addressed by your document. So can you clarify? Can you chat something else? saying, you know, is, is the, the formula that I have in the wiki page wrong, or how would you argue that? I mean, what do other people think here? I mean, so you've got the wiki page. Um, its formula is clearly going to be a length contraction here. So that's this formula here. That's the length contraction formula. And so that's not going to be a length expansion formula. So what else here have an opinion here besides uh, draft science? Uh, or, or Bill, certainly you as a neutral party should have some uh, something to say about whether I am correct that uh, Abichek simply have got the wrong formula. It, uh, it seems so because this formula um, is almost looks like it's expanding instead of contracting. Well, I mean, that's what he was saying is that the, the, the formula in, in uh, the, the, the Bryant paper, it would be an expansion, but, uh, this, but the length contraction formula is basically, you know, it's not it's not this thing. This is not the length expansion formula. 
and I'm not sure what X is. I'm not sure what VT is. Wow. So for him to assume that that is the length contraction formula, uh, when I don't even see where the L and the L not are in this, which is just, uh, it doesn't really even apply. I'm not exactly sure what this formula is. He said that it comes from the, the Bryant paper. I'm really curious as to, you know, does he agree that that's just not traction formula or, or what is his argument? So unfortunately, he can only, uh, and I think we just lost him. So maybe he's trying to come back in. But otherwise, that would be my conclusion that uh, whatever the Bryant paper was trying to say, Abhichek may have been extending it uh, well too far to its uh, region of applicability. But let's see what other things. Uh, he also mentioned that this has been derived by using normalization. And uh, so this thing is called the, this thing here, the, the square root one minus B squared minus C squared. That's called the Lorentz factor. And that was definitely not derived using normalization. I mean, that was derived using Pythagorean's theorem. That's what the square root is in there for, right? So there's no normalization involved in this equation as, as far as I'm, as far as I know. I mean, it's, it's trivial to derive this thing because it's just figuring out the hypotenuse. That's what it is. Do I have any agreement or disagreement on that? Well, I agree that the Lorenz fashion of whatever mathematics is just a way of averaging something and preventing the two extremes from existing. Well, you do. I mean, you do understand the 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 derivation. I mean, if most relativity websites will show that where there's a and uh, there's a there's one factor going like on the y-axis, another factor going the x factor, and then you have the hypotenuse. And what you're doing is you're figuring the hypotenuse. This the hypotenuse is the same as the Lorentz factor. <laughs> But it's also a limiter. So there's no, there's no normal. I don't know where he gets this normalization thing from. Let's see if Wiki has something about that. Lorentz factor. So there's a Lorentz factor. But how do they derive it? Uh, you can change your screen share. I didn't change my screen share. Okay. As you can see what I'm doing here. So I went, went to the wiki page on the Lorentz factor. And I don't see derivation on this page. Lorentz transformation. So I don't see that as being. Maybe if we look up uh, Lorentz factor derivation. If that has anything to do with normalization. Derivations of Lorentz transformation. I think I could just get the competing derivations, but you know, the Galilean derivation, blah, blah, blah. Standard configuration. Well, this is all Greek. Yeah, the solution. <laughs> yeah, solution. Wow, it's a solution. Well, like I said, I thought it was just uh, easily derived. 
I'm just saying if, if from uh, why something's in a formula, right? So just we know that's a variable put in the formula, and we know that it's basically saying, you know, that the one, okay, will never exist because you'd have to divide by the speed of light by the speed of light, you know what I mean, to get the one, right? So you're always going to have some percentage of the one. It's always going to be a decimal point. So essentially, it's like taking the cosine of something, right? Or it's a sine. You're basically just limiting. Well, it certainly you're, serves that. You're, you're turning but the C squared turning the square into a comes directly from. A, well, it's a percentage, right? So it's a special percentage the, because the right, C percentage. squared over B squared comes from the hypotenuse. Right, but it's a percentage. You're turning, you're turning uh, an absolute into a percentage. That's sort of what it comes down to, right? You're saying it's a percent of the whole. Yes, but a particular percentage. Right. So, so, um, yeah. So it's uh, not a straight percentage. In my opinion, it doesn't need to be in the equation. It only exists in the equation to prevent the equation from allowing you to create infinities. Well, I would probably disagree with that because it doesn't explain the particular format of the Lorentz factor. Any percentage would have worked then. They could have used anything. Zero to 100 percent, you know, percent of C. But that's not the that's not the formula. The, the, the formula has to do with the square root of C squared over B squared. And the, the, the way you get to that is Pythagorean's theorem. Right, but they aren't going to end up with a parabola, so they're not going to end up with a hypotenuse. They're going to end up with a parabola that says you contract more as you approach the speed of light, and you contract less the slower you're going. So the contraction is at a higher percentage. It's not a straight percentage. It's not like if you go half the speed of light, you're half contracted. It's um, a parabola. I don't know what this has to do with parabola. <laughs> well, it has to do with. But in any case, we are we well, are getting towards saying, the end. Uh, well, I mean, you don't know what I mean. Uh, the parabola has that line, like the like the same bent space curve. So bent space isn't a hypotenuse. Bent space is a curved line, and length contraction is also a curved line. Well, it's definitely a curve. I mean, it's. It's an exponential square root uh, thing, so it's definitely not linear. Yeah, that's just my but point. But in any case, uh, it's too bad that Abercheck uh, could never get his audio working and uh, really couldn't participate it. Participate, but uh, I would say that I, looking at the available evidence, that uh, his objections. Uh, which were that uh, it this that this formula is derived using normalization. I would say is this false. I would say this is derived purely using uh, Pythagorean's theorem and not normalization. And I am not sure what this mistreats the average intercept length is about. Um, this third point is that this equation is used for length contraction. I would contend is simply incorrect. The correct formula for length contraction does produce lengths which are less um, as the velocity increases rather than expanding. So, uh, like I said, it's unfortunate that Abacek could not uh, be here to explain what his points are. All those points do appear to be uh, motivated from this paper by Stephen Bryant. So, if anyone is interested in that, um, he, they, can, they, they can take a look at that. I believe that link is in the chat. But I believe uh, we have come to the end of uh, this uh, uh, science chat, and I thank all participants. And uh, hopefully um, we'll, be, we'll be able to um, not have quite so many technical problems. We seem to have lots of technical problems with people not being able to uh, hear the speakers or being able to connect or being able to use their microphones. Um, but uh, that that is that. Now, one change is that we are going to be changing the system that we are going to be using for these Saturday science chats. 
uh, starting the, uh, probably the next chat. There's something called Easy Talk, which we, which we will be using. So uh, watch out for that change in the, uh, the mails I send out with MailChimp. There will likely be new instructions on how to use that new chatting system since uh, this one uh, is being turned off at the end of this month. All right. 